Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You are watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, and I have a very powerful, powerful uh, presentation I want to share with you, and it has a lot to do um, with uh, Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, the two sticks, uh, uh, the stick of Joseph, uh, Ephraim, uh, in, the, in, in the hand of Ephraim, as well as the stick of Judah. I'm uh, going to go into that today. Uh, let me just let me just kind of let's do a little preview here before we jump down here to verses 21. We get into there. Uh, so many of you guys I know are familiar with this. The hand of the Lord, Ezekiel says, was upon me and set me. Uh, excuse me, upon me, and the Lord carried me out in the spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones and he caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest then he said unto me prophesy over these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord thus saith the Lord God unto these bones behold I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live all right. Now, just very fascinating here. And by the way, there, I want to. I'm going to correct a couple of things here in the translation here, uh, because when he says here in verse five, where he says, "Thus saith the Lord God unto those bones," see, "Ko amar Adonai Yahuwah le leetzamot ha'ele." See, and by the way. I got to throw this in there before I start telling what I'm about to tell you here. You know how many people run around trying to say, thus saith the Lord? You ever notice that? I, I see it here on YouTube from time to time. I've seen it before in past. People, they'll get a revelation and when they say, thus saith the Lord, it's supposed to be some powerful thing that they're moved by the hand of the Almighty and that what they're about to say is truly from God Himself. Well, I'm about to let the air out of your sails because the only one that can truly say, thus saith the Lord, has to be a prophet of God and secondarily, if he's just running around saying, thus saith the Lord, like what you hear in English, He's not speaking on behalf of the Almighty. Now, that might be something that blows many of you guys away, but let me explain to you why I say that. Because thus saith the Lord, and just using the English word Lord, has nothing to do with God Himself. You have to know how to say the divine name. Because in Hebrew it says, Ka Omer Adonai Yahuwah. And Yahuwah is not even the right way to say or to pronounce God's divine name. I can take you into apocryphal writings, even where Yeshua himself deals with the divine name of Almighty God and says the people don't even know how to say it. Tell me that the Jewish rabbis then were wrong when they said that they don't know how to say it. What about Zephaniah? Zephaniah says that the divine name will be revealed. When? Let, 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 let's, all right, we're going we're gonna to jump over there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Micah's section here. It just remind me to go back down to 11. I know you guys can't remind me of anything, but anyway, I'll just say it for a joke. All right? So, all right, let's, let's take a look at Zephaniah. I think it's chapter 3 here is where Zephaniah speaks about that. Um, let's just see here. Where is it at here? Yes, here, here it is right here. What does God say here in verse 8? Therefore, wait ye for me. Lachan haku le naum Yahuwah. Wait on the Lord. Wait upon Yahuwah. All right? Until the day that I will rise to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people, ki as, excuse me, I don't have good glasses on, apecha el chaamim, See, then I will turn to the peoples a pure language 
that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. Do you know in another one of the uh, Apocrypha writings there, I say Apocrypha, it could be, it could be um, lost books there, I don't know what you want to call them there. Um, there, are, there are a lot of writings that have been discovered here, like the book of Philip, and you can't really call that an Apocrypha, I don't guess, because it was something that was discovered in Egypt by, by archaeologists, in something that's been translated more in modern times. And, and it's, I don't say it's in that book. I forget exactly which book it's actually in. But there was one of the books there that was discovered, I think, more recently that states that the Hebrew language was the divine language of creation. And so when we see yod heh vav -Hey, for example, and I know that Nehemiah Gordon and others believe that they know the correct pronunciation with that. I don't agree with that because... Clearly, if Zaphaniah says here that I will turn to the peoples of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent, then God has to restore that pure language. And He even tells you to wait for Him to do it until the day that I will rise up to pray for my determinations to gather the nations my assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. So they have not been gathered together yet, have they? I mean, we see, we see evidence of this already, but they're not gathered there yet. They're starting to get together, and the time is really close by. And I have a feeling that this is really going to come down to where Moses, uh, when, when he says to, to God, uh, you know, they will ask me, Mashimo, what is your name? Or what is his name, literally is what it means. What is his name? And God says to them, tell them, Ihaye Ashai Haye Shalachani. I am that which I am, I will be that which I am, has sent me unto you. In fact, what's interesting, the Ihaye is the way God says that His name is. Ihaye Asha Ihaye. That is what we are to call Him. You know what's interesting? In one movie I saw where they actually they say that in there. And of course in the movie it's about Moses. And, they, and Moses is supposedly saying this over the tomb of Joseph. And they get all upset. Don't say the name. You're not supposed to speak this name. I still think, even the Ihaye, I wonder if we really know the right way to say it. Anyway, just a thought. Throwing that thought in there for you. All right, so anyway, Zaphaniah. I wanted to share that with you so you'd see this in Zaphaniah. Let's get back here to Micah. We'll save our little spot here. Thank you for reminding me, chapter, uh, verse 11. Uh, and let's get back over here to Ezekiel. So, those that say, thus saith the Lord, just kind of drives me nuts. Because, and I, I want to put that out for you guys, because I know so many people are so hooked on this. Oh my gosh, the man said, thus saith the Lord. And he doesn't even know how to say the Lord's name. That's not, thus saith the Lord. If you get a message from the Lord Himself, then He will give you the ability to say His name. As He said to Moses, in fact, that's right where it is. Moses even says, they will say, all right, we're going to go there. Let me jump back over here. We'll keep messing with the Micah when it's a lot easier to deal with. And again, just remind me where I left off at. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, Exodus. All right, what is it? Chapter 3, I believe it is, where Moses says this here. Let's run down. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, he said, I am thy God, the father of thy God of Abraham. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, and I have come down to deliver them. I'm just jumping around quick. And now behold, the cry of the children of Israel. Come now, therefore. Okay. All right. The Yomer Moshe El Ha Elohim Mi Anocheki Elecha El Paro. All right. And Moses said unto God, And who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh that I should bring uh, forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. The Yomer Ki Ehaye Elcha Vezelcha Ha Haot Ki Anoche Shalachan Excuse me Shalachtecha. Get all those Chas in there, and you get your tongue twisted there. Um, all right, And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I will have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, all right, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Okay, 
מה אומר אלכם? אל, uh, Uh, they, 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 will, they will say, what is his name? Ve'yomer Elohim el Moshe, and the Lord says to Moses, Ihaye asha ihaye, ve'yomer kot amad livnei Yisrael, ihaye shelacheni aleichem. This was the first place where ko amad ihaye asha ihaye. The first place where thus saith the Lord was given to Moses himself when he says to them, this is what you will say to them. Kota Amar. See? Thus you will say, Livne Yisrael to the sons of Israel or the children of Israel, Eliachem. And then these people run around saying, Thus saith the Lord. Oh, please give me a break. And I don't mean to hurt people's feelings when I say that. Thank you again for reminding me. Go back to verse 11. Uh, Y'all are doing great. Appreciate that. But uh, it's just gotten completely out of hand. Uh, and I really believe that. And that's another thing. When God sends His prophet on the scene, it'll be, it'll be just like with Moses. Moses will say, they will ask me, what is your name? What am I to tell them? That's still a, a mess today in Israel. They don't know his name. You don't think they're not going to ask him? Now, I never found any place where Israel ever asked Moses, uh, oh, by the way, Mashimo, they didn't ask. But they're going to ask. You can count on that. They're going to ask. All right? So anyway, we have the Valley of Dry Bones, and God says to them, uh, uh, let me back up where we were. Then he said, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Actually, he doesn't say the word breath. He says that he will, Hine ani mabi abechem ruach. The Spirit, I will cause the Spirit, them. The Spirit will be what comes into them, and they will become living. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring upon flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. Again, you have it again, and if I remember right, still we're dealing with the Ruach. Um... Yep, Bechem Ruach, right there is where it says it there on your screen. And you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, isn't this fascinating? Have any of you guys ever noticed this? So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied. I, I'm sorry, no, I left off on that. I'll tell you in a second what I was going to tell you. So I prophesied as I commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a commotion, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I beheld, and lo, there were sinews upon them, and flesh came up, and skin covered them above, and, but there was no breath in them. Veruach ein behem. The skin came upon them. The bones were together. Everything was there. It was like Adam laying there on the ground in the Garden of Eden. But there was no breath in him. But once God breathed in his nostrils, he became a living soul. i got to take you there too. Sorry. Let's, let's, let's jump real quick. I, this is going to be a long message, friends. I just pray, pray you bear with me. And believe me, it's going to be worth your time. I promise you, you will never regret this day, what you're about to learn today, by God's grace. Okay. If we run this on Israeli News Live, uh, just pray you guys will bear with me, those that are not interested in, in, in these things, but it, I believe it will be a blessing to you as well. I really do. I really believe it would be a blessing for you. All right, let's run down here. We want to get to the part where God is creating Adam. Uh, I may be in the wrong chapter. Maybe it's for chapter 1. No, no, it can't be. Let's see. Okay, here we go. And the Lord God formed man. Here we go. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Ipak bepa'av nishma chayim ha'adam lenefesh chayah. 
Do you realize that when it says he breathed in his nose, ipach ve'ipach be'pa'av, nishmat chaim, that life was God's own life itself going into that figure of Adam, and it's in the plural language just for you. Just it's good for no for for people to know. See, it says ipach be'pa'av nishmat. See. Chaim. He breathed into his nostrils and he becomes, see, he's a living, he's living right there, okay? The breath of life. Nishmat Chaim. Nishmat Chaim. That Chaim. Why is it Chaim? Why is it in the plural? Why has one man got a plural life inside of him? There's two reasons for that. One, because Eve is inside of him. And two, because we're going to be getting into DNA today. The genealogy of Adam and Eve, both in there, that life of Almighty God that's inside of there is meant to bring forth every living soul that would come down. All right? And these two. Because then notice what he says. See, then he breathes that breath of life, but it's in a plural form. But it says, a man became a living soul. Now he's going to identify Adam as an individual unit. Ve'yachicha Adam le'nefesh chaya. Now you got a singular. Imagine that. Blessed be the Lord. This is extremely exciting, and I, I haven't really been doing any deep teachings in a while, guys, and I'm, I, I, it's on my heart now uh, to really get back into doing these deep teachings, and I will tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. There's some things that's on my heart for my own people, the children of Israel, not just Israel that is in Israel today, although that's on my heart as well, but to the, all Israel all over the world. Alright, so, so I will lay sinews. So he, he breathes on them. All right? and, I, and behold, and lo, there were sinews upon the flesh, and it came up, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the, to, unto the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, and breathe, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And, and I mean, this is this is just absolutely blows me away. Prophesy to the breath, right? Look at this. Beruchot, baot be haruach. See, it's like prophesying to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come. Come to them that they may live. Mm. So I prophesied, He commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. All right. Then He said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Now notice the word house of Israel. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will... Open your graves and cause you to come up out of the graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. See, now it goes from being breath to my spirit, Ruachi. See, very next word there. Benatati ruchi bechem. That literally means, and I will give. I, there's an I right there, the the with the with the yod there. Natan uh, is for the word gift, and I will give my spirit to them, and they will live, and you will live. Okay. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thou son of man, take thee one stick. Now here it comes. This is going to get good, guys. Take one stick and write upon it for, the, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. And then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and the house of Israel and his companions. Notice, though, who is the one that is dead? Who is the one that has been in graves? It is the house of Israel who was scattered 780 years before Judah was ever scattered. And they're considered dead. 
And when he comes, though, and he takes the two sticks, now he speaks about Judah. The house of Judah, the house of Ephraim. And he speaks of one being the, the notice that, this is why I wanted you to remember this. Now, don't forget this one part up here. Where is it at? Children of, okay, the whole house of Israel, but we want the part where it says children of Israel. Well, let's put it this way here. One is called the children of Israel, the other one is called the house of Israel. Yeah, here we go, right here, right in front of me. For Judah and for the children of Israel and his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel and his companions. And join them for thee one to another into one stick that they may become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not tell us what thou meanest by thee? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them unto him together with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be uh, one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whether they are gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall be there be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defiled themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. And my servant David shall be king over them and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in mine ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. Now I'm going to kind of stop right there. One second, guys. It's a bit hot in here. Got the heater up too much. Uh, we're going to kind of stop it right there because this is where I want to start breaking things down for you. I want to really share some things in here with you. What are these two sticks? House of Judah, the house of Ephraim, right? And today, the Lord began to deal with me about this, about the two sticks. And I'm going to share with you something that's going to blow you away. Because notice, it's going to go with the message I did the other day about Hosea. Those of you here on the Noon Institute, you may not have seen the message if you don't watch our Israeli News Live program because I loaded it there. Couldn't load it on the Noon Institute because I couldn't remember how to get into the Noon Institute. But anyway, the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim, or the house of Joseph, it is so biblically laid in there, it's not even funny. Let me share something with you, though. All right, uh, first let me show, we gotta, there's a point I want to bring out here though. And my servant David shall be king over them and they shall be one shepherd and they shall also walk in mine ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land uh, that I've given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell there. And they, they and their children and their children's children and David, my servant, shall be their prince forevermore. Moreover, I will make, here is, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. All right. My dwelling place also shall be over them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, for the people that try to run around saying that the word Shekinah is not in the Bible, I'm going to show you right now. This is basically where the word uh, Shekinah comes from. Vehaya mi Shekinah. There is it. There it is right there. Sheen. Kof Nun Yod. Now, Shekinah, the way they spell it uh, in Hebrew and in, in modern days, they put uh, Shin uh, Kof Yod Nun He is how they spell it. But And we know that the word Shekinah comes from the, uh, the, uh, the idea of God's presence dwelling amongst us. And that's what he says right here. He is saying, Behaya Shekinah Aliyahem, and my presence will be among them. 
Okay, that's what it's literally saying. My dwelling place also shall be over them, all right? Upon them. Ali is upon him, them, upon them, all right? Or over them. Just like it was in the time of the wilderness journey where the Spirit of God was over them, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This is what he's saying. And I'm bringing this up for a reason now, okay? And will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. All right? Now, this is from the word Mikodeshi, the holy. My holy, my holiness will be there with them. Betochem Leolam. All right, so it's not that the holy, the, it's, this is not, by the way, we know for the fact that it says uh, right here, uh, I'll just do it in English for you, and I will multiply it and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. It doesn't say sanctuary, it says I will set my, my holiness, basically, uh, in the midst of them. So it is not just the fact that God is setting a third temple up. It has nothing to do with that. He is setting His temple, His own body, and we know this from the very fact where He says up here, they're going to say, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, and, they shall, and their children, and their children's children forever. And David my servant shall be their prince forever. This is really speaking of the son of David. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my holiness, my holiness, in the midst of them. Okay? In the midst of them forever. Leolam. My dwelling place. Vehaya mishakainya eliachem. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. All right? Now, that goes back to Hosea. Say to them who are not my people, they are my people. You're right? I mean, remember Hosea the prophet where he married the, the prostitute and she has the one child and said, call his name Loami. You're not my people. And then later they become his people, right? All right, so this is what it is. This is the redemption of Israel. This is, this is Daniel chapter 9, verses 24, 25, 26. This is what it is. You're looking at the redemption. But here's what's interesting. Let's, look, let's prove this part about this body, this place of dwelling. This is something very interesting. If we look in the uh, King James Version Bible here, and we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared. Me. Now, where does this scripture come from? Because we can't really seem to find a scripture anywhere in the Bible that actually speaks about, but a body has not prepared me. Kind of makes you wonder if maybe the writer of Hebrews, I believe this is Paul that wrote this. Uh, there's some debate over that, who wrote it, but let's just say Paul for sake of argument. But uh, makes you kind of wonder then, what, what version did he get that we didn't get, Right? All right, because, but a body has now prepared me. My guess would be, and I know a lot of scholars believe as well, it comes from Psalm chapter 40. All right, because here we have here, sacrifice and meal offering thou hast no delight in. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offerings and sin offering hast thou not required. I find that very interesting to begin with. Mine ears hast thou opened. It's as if David didn't know this originally, but now he's hearing. Now he understands. This was not what God's perfect will was, right? But here's what's interesting, and I'm going to really help you guys out on this because the translation of this is not the best in the world, but you're going to find out that, yes, it is a body has thou prepared me. Then said I, lo, I come with the roll of a book which is prescribed for me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is my inmost uh, is in my in, uh, innermost parts, or inmost parts. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I did not refrain my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Hmm. Now let's take a look at what it actually says. As uh, Amati, all right, then I said, Hineni Baati, behold, I come, be Migelot Sefer, with a rolled scroll. Ketov Ali, 
Now they put on here, which is prescribed for me. Let me take a look real quick with, with the KJV, because maybe KJV has it worded better. I'm not sure here. Let's just take a look. Um, you know, that's that's sometimes that's a big issue people have. They they the different translations. Some say, well, the King James Version is the only one, or the 1611, etc. You know, different opinions on that. I, there's good things in every translation. I, I, I just have to tell you, there there are good things in every translation. But some do better than others in certain areas, and not so good in other areas. And um, and of course, it's, it depends on the, the the scholar that's reading it and what their opinion is of the of the translation. There's there's debates on that, uh, and I know that for a fact. But um, in some cases, that's the way it is. All right. So we're going to be looking at verse eight. You have to make sure it's verse eight because sometimes it doesn't work. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Uh, now that is more correct. I know that for a fact. Um, I come in the I come in the let's see. Then said I, Lo, I come in the the book. It is written of me. I delight to do Thy will, O God. Yea, the, Thy law is within my heart. I have preached the righteousness and in in the great congregations, and I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, Thou knowest, uh, etc., etc. All right. So now, then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Uh, again, I understand what they're saying. The the the, the King James Version here gives a better uh, idea because it is speaking of a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. But even they do not, they still do not translate it correctly either. And that's what I wanted to bring down to you. Look in, let's look back at, um, um, so they say here, let's, let's look at verse 8 again. I think we're off on the verse. Then said, I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Verse 7 is what they've got. Whoops, sorry. And all right, they, the verses are, are, are one off. All right, so their verse seven is our, the verse eight here. Then said I, Lo, I come in the roll of the book which is prescribed for me. And they say that it's written of me. King James Version says it's written of me. Okay, um, and that's probably more correct because as Amati uh, says, uh, then I said, Hine uh, Baati, then, uh, th uh, then, then I said, uh, behold, I come be uh, Safel with a rolled scroll katav Ali uh, written uh, about me or upon me. Actually, it's upon me. It's not even written about me. And that's that's where it's that's where the tough part is. Ali Ali is upon. And this is the part that I find that is interesting. If you look at what he's saying here. Then said I, I lo, I come in the roll of the book which is prescribed for me. Or let me use the King James Version for just a moment. Maybe it'll, maybe we can catch it there better. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. It's not a volume either. It's in the roll of a book. It is written of me or written about me. Now, I like King James Version better because it definitely gives us the, the, the feel that we're speaking about the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so I do like that better. I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. But it's the next verse, verse 8 in KJV, verse 9 in the Hebrew Torah scroll. Notice what he says here. I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is in my innermost parts. Okay, la'asot rosonecha, which is uh, 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 to do your will. Elohai uh, Afotzeti, uh, uh, which is my God. Uh, Yea, uh, let's see, Betoratecha. All right, so he's speaking about the, the uh, hang on one second here. All right, so let me take you like this right here. The, the word ordering here is a little bit different than what you would say in English. When we say, I delight to do thy will, oh my God. Uh, literally, we have La Sot Rotanecha, which is, to, to do uh, what you want, what you want to do, what you want. But the word delight or desire is a better way. Uh, my desire right here. Uh, excuse me. Okay, is where it just ends up over here. So uh, I delight to do your, your uh, what you want, O oh God. All right. Vetoratecha. All right. And your law, betok me, uh, me ai, which uh, 
is literally meaning it is between my bowels or in, within me. Now, I'm, I'm making this point for a reason, guys. I want, there's something I want you to catch here. Look at verse 10. I have preached the righteousness in the great congregation. Lord, I did not refrain my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness with, excuse me, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. All right? Now, notice what he said, though. Notice where he says that he didn't hide it at. Okay? He did not hide. He says, I have not hid thy righteousness in my heart. Betoch Levi. Again, it's not just in, it's Betoch. Betoch Levi. All right? Now, if we go back up here and we look at the innermost part, here we go. Betoch again, Betoch Me'aya, which is within my inward parts. So I did not, he says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart, betoch levi. So when he was actually saying me'aya, he was, when he said the inward parts is what he's saying, he's literally, now he's defining for you where that word of God was hidden at, and it was God's law, and it was hidden inside of his heart. But notice though what's fascinating. Sacrifice and meal offering thou hast no delight in, my ears hast thou opened. Burn offerings and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come with the roll of a book which is prescribed for me, which is completely wrong translation. Azamati, when then I said, Hineni ba'ati bemigalat safer. All right, and then he says, Behold, I come with a rolled scroll written upon me. What is it? Now, this is truly about the coming of the Messiah, but what is it? It is the rolled scroll is his own DNA where God has written it because he says that law was in his inward parts. It's written inside of him. It is written on his DNA. That book that's rolled up was written inside of him. And it goes along perfectly with what God showed me in the Apocrypha of Moses when he told, when he told uh, what was it? It was uh, uh, Joshua Benun. He says to Joshua, he said, Take the books that I have written and put them inside an earthen vessel that was made from the foundation of the earth. And the Lord showed me immediately that he was speaking about his own body. In other words, when he read the pure writings that Moses had given him, those went on the scroll of his own DNA. And that was to be held to come down in time as his children were born, and his children were born, and their children were born. And even if it crosses from a mother, uh, a father to a daughter, to a daughter, to another husband, and another generation, that word of God, that pure word of God is with inside of us and that's the part that God has got to wake up it's in you that's why it says in the New Testament the word of God and he's quoting actually from Moses own word is nigh you even in you it is in your mouth it is what in your heart imagine that so now we have two sticks. Now I'm going to show you who those two sticks are. That's what's going to really get you, is who these two sticks are. Let's go back to Hosea. Remember what we spoke about the other day? Remember now, the sticks is the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph, but it's in Ephraim's hand. Isn't that interesting? The stick is in Ephraim's hand, but it's actually Joseph's stick. All right, let's look at Hosea. Remember the lesson we did the other day. For their mother hath played the harlot, she that conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go for my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. That's Israel. That was Israel that was blinded to who Yeshua was. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and I will make a wall against her that she shall not find her paths. Hedge up thy way. Did not Yeshua say, I am the life, the truth, and the way? And no man can go to the Father except by me. And that way which was Christ Jesus was hedged up with thorns when they put the crown of thorns upon his head. Jeez. 
a plain sign, plain as day. And, and, and Hosea had already prophesied to you. Hosea prophesied what kind of life Israel was living and then said that your way, your way to get back home will be hedged up with thorns because you'll put a crown of thorns on him. And you know, I, I realize, that my Jewish brothers, you might say, well, that was the Romans that put the crown of thorns on him. Well, it was the Romans that put him on the cross as well. But it was our priests that consented to him. And by the way, the only reason they consented to him because they were not the true priest of God. They were the Hashmonite dynasty, which was not the Zadokite priesthood, and that's how it all got messed up. Had no business. And what was it? Benjamites. No wonder why Joseph put the cup in Benjamin's bag. Benjamin was not guilty of selling out Joseph, but it was prophetically put there, letting you know that Benjamites were going to sell out the Messiah. And what was it? It was a Benjamite false priesthood that came on the throne inside the temple and took and delivered Yeshua up to be condemned. Is that right? And here we have right here, Hosea shows you, Yeshua plays out two roles. He played out his own role as being the one that, this, that their way would be hedged up with thorns. Now watch this. And she shall run after her lovers, but, he shall, but, excuse me, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then was it better with me than now? For she did not know that it was I that gave her the corn and the wine and the oil and multiplied into her her silver and gold which they used for Baal. Now you have now you have the Almighty saying that it was I that gave her the corn and the wine and the oil multiplied into her silver and gold. That was Joseph. There's your two sticks. Joseph right here represented and when we look at Hosea, we're speaking, it's speaking about the house of Judah and the house of Israel both. That's why he says, Lo Ami, Lo Ruhuma. Therefore will I take back my corn and the time thereof and my wine and the season thereof, and I will snatch away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now I will uncover her shame in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease from her feasts and her new moons and her Sabbaths and her appointed seasons. And that's exactly what happened in 70 A.D. See, God says to about the house of Israel, you are lo ami, you are not my people. Why? They went into captivity. But then he says, ami, and say to your sister, Ruma, pitied, and my people. Because during the time of Yeshua, when he sent out the 70 to the nations and his 12 apostles to all the 12 tribes of Israel, what did he say? Go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's exactly what they did. And they became my people. And they became pitied. He says, Well, I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, and whereof she hath said, These are my hire, and these are my hire have given, or my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, which she offered unto them, and decked herself in her earrings and her jewels, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. Now notice, this is long after, long after the time of the wilderness journey, when they begin to serve Baal. But he says, I'm going to visit upon her. You got Rome. You got your modern day Balaam, the Roman Catholic Church, right there. They're there for you to give you all you want. Give you your gold, give you your earrings and everything else that you want. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly unto her. I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope, which is the word Achor uh, in Hebrew. Achor is muddy. It remind, should remind Israel of the mud pits, shouldn't it? And she shall respond there as in the days of her youth and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shall call me no more Bali. Ishi is from the fire of Almighty God. Not Bali. 
under Balaam, Balaam being your husband. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be mentioned by their name. And in that day I will have a covenant for them with the beast of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow of the, and the sword and the battle out of the land and will make them to lie down safely. See, that's what it is. And this is why he speaks, David says in the 40th Psalm. Notice what he says there again. Sacrifice and meal offering thou hast not delight in. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering uh, hast thou not required. You understand? You see what Hosea is showing? When God comes to Israel with that final message that will wake Israel up, not just Israel, the house of Judah, but the house of of Israel as well, the two sticks are going to be woke up and the, the, the gospel that will be preached to them happens to be the millennial reign gospel. Remember what happens in the millennium reign? There nothing shall hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain. See God, why? Because God makes a covenant not just with us but even with the beast of the field and with the fowls of heaven. We don't have a need for sacrifice any longer. Yeshua gave his life. What greater sacrifice could there be? None. He says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Is that not incredible? Now, I mentioned to you about Psalm 40 about how that this was written inside of his heart. And we talked about the two sticks. And those two sticks become one. And I believe that also the sticks also represent a cord of DNA. And by the way, the word stick in Hebrew is used there as the word tree, eights. And what's interesting is in Micah 7, when he says right here, all right. Let me find the right place. But as for me, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, though I am fallen. I shall arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against Him until He plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and, shall behold, and I shall behold His righteousness. Then my enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her who said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall gaze upon her, and now shall she be trodden down as a mire of the streets. The day for building thy walls, even that day, shall be far removed. <laughs> there shall be a day when they shall come unto thee from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt even to the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. So, God is letting us know not, He's going to deliver us and we have to bear the indignation for a season. Then He tells us, then what happens here in verse 12, verse 13 here, is He gives us a time frame of when it's going to happen. They're going to come to us. There's going to be an invasion on Israel that is coming. They're going to come from Syria. It says Assyria, which is Syria. They're going to come to us from there, from Egypt, and from Egypt even to the river, and from sea to sea, from the Mediterranean, from the river, from Jordan, in other words, from the Red Sea in the south. That's why it says sea to sea, from mountain to mountain. And the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because the fruit of their doings. Now that's actually a compound fulfillment. That deals with Syria. Because some of these guys got up there and protested against Bashar al-Assad, and the next thing you know, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, uh, excuse me, Turkey, and all these groups there joined in with them and caused a massive refugee crisis that's unparalleled in modern history. Then notice what he says. Tend thy people with thy staff, the flock of thy heritage. Ro'e amcha beshebitecha. Beshbetecha is the word there used for a staff, 
but it's actually, it's a rod of lineage. It is a rod of ancestry is what it is. Uh, and it does use the word heritage as well, thy heritage. So literally, Ro'e Amcha, shepherd your people. And that rod, as I said before to you, I believe is the very DNA that Moses, that's in his DNA, I should say. But what's interesting though, when it says the flock of thy heritage, the word that is used there in Hebrew for that flock of his heritage, the word heritage there, is what he has inherited. Now, is this speaking of Moses, or is this speaking of the coming of the Messiah? That I'm not sure of. But it may be Moses. What's interesting is he's to shepherd them with a staff. A staff that is written within him. He says, as the forest in the midst of a fruitful field, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, as in the days of thy coming forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things, wonder, wonderful things. The nations shall see and be put to shame for all their might. We are about to see, friends, an incredible thing happen with Israel. But what I wanted to really get my point across, it's not limited to Israel that's living in the modern day country of Israel today. He takes those two rods, those two sticks, Ephraim and the rod of Judah, the rod of Judah and the rod of Joseph, that is. And he binds them together into one stick. And what's interesting is Yeshua he was the one that came as that rod of Jesse, the rod of Judah, from the tribe of Judah. When it speaks in Hosea, it mentions Yeshua as, as being the very one that was the one that gave them their corn and their wine and multiplied their gold and silver, which they ended up using for Balaam. Again, a type of Jesus inside of Joseph. The two sticks, Ephraim and Manasseh. He is the root and offspring of David. He is the rod that is spoken of in the Bible as well. And those two sticks are placed together and become one rod, become one stick. I think we're in for a very interesting time coming very soon. And I don't know, this may be confusing to you guys in what I've said. I hope not. I've tried to make it as simple as I can. But we're about to see a remarkable, remarkable event to happen in modern times. The gospel of Yeshua will go to the house of Judah and will wake them up. But also we will be like, as far as those of us that are of the house of Ephraim, the house of Joseph, those lost tribes that are scattered through all the earth there, we will be woke up as well. You have to remember we are like the valley full of dry bones. Dead. Needing the Spirit of Almighty God to live within us. And I know many of us, we believe that we have the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you don't have the Holy Spirit. But we do have a need for being ready for the bridegroom. And the only way we're ever going to be ready for the bridegroom is when we are, are perfect. And I think the same message that will wake up the house of Judah is going to wake up the house of Israel. It's going to wake up the Gentile bride, as we might call it. It comes an awakening time, and that time, I believe, is now. We are moving into that season right now. With all the world going nuts, we are moving into that season. So I trust that this message has been a blessing, and maybe I should shorten it somehow uh, because I know it's a lot of information. So anyway, I want to thank you for watching.
And also, just as a reminder, if you would like to help us, we do need your support uh, in continuing this ministry, the work that we do, both uh, with the Noon Institute as well as with Israeli News Live, our prophetic broadcast that we try to bring from time to time on there as well. So if you'd like to support this work, go to IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. You can donate online at either place or our mailing address appears at the end of the video. Shalom and God bless you.